testing has begun. Welcome everyone. We're gonna start off with a introduction about Code for Canada from our Director of Outreach, Luke. And then Shine and Evan from the MOVE team will walk through what MOVE is and how it works. Then we'll go into breakout rooms. We have one with Code for Canada staff for all of your questions about our programs and what we do. We have a room with digital government um, <clears throat> with Jesse and Akash from the City of Toronto Transportation Services, who can talk about the government side of MOVE. And more on MOVE with the MOVE team, Shine, Evan, and Maddie. So I'm going to pass it over to Luke to do the introduction for Code for Canada. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon and or uh, good whatever time it is uh, where you're joining us from. I definitely see some folks I know from BC, so it's a bit earlier out there. Um, before before we get in um, to all this, I just want to say thanks. Um, I feel like a bit of a broken record these days, but as we celebrate the celebrate <laughs> the one year anniversary of the as we mark the one year anniversary of the, of the pandemic, I feel like time and in more specifically energy is at such a premium right now. So the fact that all of you are choosing to spend a bit of time and energy with us this afternoon, um, we're really grateful for that. And uh, we hope that uh, you know you learn something and you, and you get a bit inspired by the work uh, of the MOVE team. And on a personal note, um, uh, before I joined Code for Canada, I was a journalist. I was a reporter for, for a decade. And I, I spent the latter years of my career actually covering kind of municipal issues with a real focus on road safety and, and road design. Um, and, you know, I spoke with the victims of, of road violence and I, and I met people, you know, trying to push for change and learned all about Vision Zero and, and these sorts of things through that process. And so I really like this project in particular really kind of is an intersection of my, you know, real passion for civic tech and also my uh, desire to see safer streets in the city that I call home. So, um, you know, I, I really uh, have a kind of a, a particular place in my heart for this project. So um, anyway, that's, that's enough about me <laughs> and my history. Um, if you've um, never been to a, a Code for Canada event, we want to thank you and, and also tell you a bit about ourselves. So Code for Canada is a national nonprofit we launched in, in 2017 uh, with the mission of connecting government innovators. So, you know, ambitious public servants who are trying to, to bring new ways of working into government and, and deliver better outcomes, more user-centered services for, for people uh, with uh, innovators from the technology and design community, folks like Maddie, Evan, and Shine, who, who you'll meet today, um, who have the, the digital skills and, and, and the know-how um, to really make kind of public services uh, incredible and, and really user-friendly. And we want to bring them together so they can collaborate um, and ultimately deliver better outcomes for people. We like to sort of talk about our work as having these two uh, related but distinct pillars. Uh, so our programs all work to build the digital capacity inside of government. So to help uh, the public service leverage the tools of technology, design, and data uh, to deliver better outcomes and services for residents, while also building civic capacity in Canada's technology and design sector. Uh, so that means creating avenues uh, for people with technology and design skills to use those skills in the public interest. Right, give them a chance to, to work on projects at scale and work on projects that matter and work on projects that have a real impact uh, for, their, for their neighbors and, and, and fellow residents and fellow Canadians. So we do that um, in a number of different ways. Uh, first and foremost, uh, you might be familiar with our fellowship program. Um, I think it's the next slide. Uh, so the fellowship program is actually where MOVE started and, and um, it's a, a kind of a program that connects um, technology and design professionals typically from the private sector uh, with people in government uh, and we embed those uh, fellows inside of government departments where they work shoulder to shoulder uh, with public servants on really exciting and innovative projects. Um, it's typically 10 months but uh, we explore, you know, we're exploring some different options for that. Um, next slide. We also have a community network program. So I don't, I don't know um, if, if many of you have been to a local civic tech meetup in your city. So Civic Tech Toronto uh, here in, in, in our city, but uh, we work to kind of support uh, the formation and growth of grassroots civic technology groups in cities all across Canada, where uh, local folks can come together and put the tools of technology design and data to work on the challenges that are impacting their communities. So, um, you know, that's a, a really great program. And, and if you haven't been to a civic tech meetup, I totally encourage you to go to one. We also have an education program that equips public servants with uh, kind of the training and, and, and the skills they need to succeed in the digital era. So, you know, uh, workshops and, and trainings and, and other kind of like experiential learning opportunities related to things like agile development or human centered design. Um, 
Some of our more recent programs include Civic Hall Toronto, which is a uh, kind of a hub for municipal public servants and municipal innovators, a chance to really connect those folks with their local civic tech communities so they can collaborate, um, you know, on, on all sorts of projects. And we work with a, a number of uh, departments at the City of Toronto through this program and created uh, sort of avenues for local civic tech folks to get involved at, at the municipal level. Um, and lastly, our, our, our newest program uh, is known as GRIT, which stands for Gathering Residents to Improve Technology, uh, and it is a civic usability testing service. So uh, what that means is that people who are building technology and ideally building technology in a fairly agile and iterative way need lots of opportunities to test their products with potential users to see if they're on the right track. Uh, and what GRIT helps them do is connect not only with users, but a truly diverse and representative sample of users so that they can make sure that, you know, as they're testing their products, they're catching blind spots, um, you know, and building products that are really inclusive and intended to serve everybody. Uh, so, you know, just a, a couple of, you know, uh, really uh, quick, you know, look, look at our impact so far, right? Um, since 2017, we've embedded 51 fellows across 17 government departments, uh, and we're in the process of recruiting for our sixth cohort of fellows. So if you're a public servant in the room uh, and you're interested in, in some of the programming or, or, or want to do a project like Move With Us, um, you can get in touch. I think uh, shout out to Kevin. He's hanging out in the chat. Uh, he's from our partnerships team. You can talk to him. Um, since we formed in 2017, we've actually seen seven new uh, Canadian civic tech groups emerge in communities across the country. Um, notably, there's been some real incredible work done in, in the Maritime, so I encourage you to check out Civic Tech Fredericton, St. John and Halifax. Uh, they're doing incredible work. Next slide. Uh, we have, you know, across all our different channels from Slack to Twitter to our newsletter to, you know, our, our fellowship and partner alumni network, we've got over 8,000 um, engaged community members so people all across the country who are in interested in civic technology and, and uh, digital government. Uh, and uh, since GRIT's formed, I think this number might even be a little out of date. We've done a couple of tests recently, but um, uh, we've connected uh, 13 civic usability tests, helping people in both the public and private sector uh, connect with a really diverse and representative sample of users to test their products. So ultimately, um, what we like to think that we're here to do uh, is to meet government teams in particular, wherever they are on their digital transformation journey. Right. The tools of digital are essential to creating uh, great, enjoyable, delightful, user centered um, you know, experiences for people. And that can look like, you know, everything from, you know, your team might need a, a one day workshop or a six week collaboration or a 10 month fellowship. Right. Um, you know, our, our offerings really try to meet uh, the public sector where it's at in terms of digital. Um, and we really want to hear from you. So um, let us know what challenges you're facing, what goals you want to achieve, um, and hopefully we can find a way to work together. Uh, so that's a bit about me. That's a bit about Code for Canada. Uh, but uh, we're all here today to hear from uh, an incredible uh, example of this kind of cross-sector collaboration, the MOVE team. Um, so it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce, I believe, Evan and Akash, am I correct, uh, on that to, uh, to tell us a little bit more about MOVE before we head into the breakout rooms. Thanks, everyone. Just going to bring up the slides. Thanks, Arun. It is actually not Akash, it is I, Shine. Cool. And hey, hi, hey everyone. Um, we are really excited to be here and talk with you all about MOVE today. And my name is Shine Chowdhury, the design lead at MOVE, and I'm here with yeah, I'm Evan Savage. I'm the development lead at Move, um, and uh, we're both really, really happy that so many of you could join us today uh, as we sort of talk about this project called Move. Um, we'll go on about what that is, but in a nutshell, it's a new platform for the city's uh, traffic counts and collision data, um, developed in partnership between Copa Canada and City of Toronto Transportation Services. It's something that we've been working on for a while. Uh, this timeline only shows back to about October 2018, but even before that, uh, the people at Copa Canada were laying the groundwork, uh, having the difficult conversations with people in uh, sort of the management of transportation services to even make it possible for us to be in the door. So uh, definitely wanted to acknowledge that as well. Once that happens, um, we had a 10-month fellowship as the fellowship program that you heard about before. Um, and that was sort of, the way that's typically framed is um, we 
start with the assumption that we're going to be doing basic research into what exactly people need, what the problem is, how the problem should be scoped, and then we start to build things. And um, so the outcome of the fellowship is less, uh, from experience over several, over several different fellowship projects, is less we're going to completely finish the thing because the thing is often in part of an ongoing process. And so it's much more realistic that we're going to uh, do a bunch of user research to understand what the problem even is and build sort of a prototype or alpha version of something that uh, we can put in front of users and start to validate uh, our perception of the problem. Uh, once we had that done, we then had about a year long process uh, to take that prototype and turn it into something that could be fully put in front of our, our users who are staff at the City of Toronto Transportation Services doing the vital work of you know, all the design work, all the planning and uh, engineering work that goes into uh, designing our roads for maximal safety. Um, and we're, we're super proud to uh, have reached that milestone um, mid last December. So in the middle of all of this chaos, we shipped a thing, people at the city of Toronto are using that thing as we speak. Right now, uh, we're in a sort of continual process of iteration on that. And we'll, we'll see a bit more about what iteration looks like for us, but uh, rest assured, it's not like we're done and we go away. It's part of an ongoing process of continually improving that service that we provide. Throughout this whole thing, we, we bring to this work uh, what you could think of as the digital services approach. It's common to, uh, if you talk to ODS, CDS, GDS, any of the digital service groups, they all kind of have a similar framing. This happens to be a photo from the Ontario Digital Service offices, but the principles on that wall could be equally held well for our work and for the work of many digital service groups around the world. And they basically boil down to three things. Human-centered design that is done with, for, alongside users. Uh, so we, we want to research with our users. We want to test our things with our users. We want to bring them into the design process where possible. We build prototypes using an iterative development approach. We don't just go away, take like a giant sheaf of uh, requirements and then disappear into a dark room somewhere. We build things quickly, we get things in front of users, we vet that we are on the right track. And finally, we do all of this as much in the open as possible um, so that both people can see the value of this work openly and so that our government partners, so that there's that sort of ongoing knowledge transfer. Uh, what a, a big part of the outcome is not just the product we're delivering, but the fact that the way in which we deliver it becomes accessible to our partners. So all of this starts, of course, with understanding the problem in the first place. Uh, so right from the beginning of the fellowship, we engage with people throughout transportation services to understand what, what do you need from this collision and volume data? And we soon found that uh, there are two core systems that they use called crash and flow. Uh, crash for collision data, flow for traffic volume data. And they've been using them for the last 20 years or so. Now, these might look retro, and they are. That's because they date back about that long. I do want to under underline that at the time that they were released, this was a substantial step forward from dealing with paper forms. The fact that they could access this information digitally at all was revolutionary. But fast forward 20 years, the kinds of work have changed. The, the sort of way in which we think about is an interface usable or not, that has changed. Uh, the complexity of the analysis, the amount of data, all of these things have changed. These interfaces have not. In the meantime, all kinds of manual workarounds have propped up to sort of fill in the gaps of, of these systems and where they don't meet current needs. So this diagram on the left here, for instance, uh, I remember during the fellowship, we went and we talked to a co-op student who was working in a windowless room on the ground floor of Toronto City Hall. And they had been drawing these red circles painstakingly on the sheet of paper for about a day and a half because the tools they had did not allow them to generate this diagram, but the diagram was crucial for certain kinds of analysis. I've, I've mentioned several times we were working with a lot of collision and traffic volume data. Uh, that means that alongside the research into our users and their needs, we also needed to do a parallel amount of research into what is the data? What does this look like? Where is it coming from? How is it collected? what can we do with it? Where are the pain points in that process? So sort of a user research process, but again, also because this was a heavily data-oriented project, a sort of technical research process was needed alongside that. 
Uh, and then obviously, obviously uh, even though that was sort of like a phase in our fellowship, we never stopped doing this research uh, because the needs of the department evolve over time. That's, that's a big thing that we try to get across that uh, breaking with the traditional model of digital service delivery means recognizing that there is no point in time at which your needs become fixed magically. Uh, examples of that for this work, you know, there's more multimodal transportation, there's more automated counting, so more and more data of higher and higher quality and more and more coverage is coming into the system. And, you know, we're still dealing with uh, the sort of aftershocks of the amalgamation of Toronto and the fact that places in different cities still do things as though they were different cities. So that, that's, that's definitely a thing that, that they're starting to look at, how do we unify these processes? Well, speaking about unifying processes, transportation services itself has many teams. And in order to accurately consolidate all the processes across the teams and to help build move, we need to take that human-centered approach for our research and development. We started a project panel kickoff. And at this point, it's really key to get everyone at the room here. And this helped to really humanize the problem that we're trying to solve. The image that you're seeing right now is off an icebreaker where various stakeholders were presenting themselves as trading cards. But we took it, obviously, multiple steps further. It's important to get everyone involved. And we, we know that from a very early set. So, the idea is that, that the promise that we have made of change is essentially tangible for them. Again, as transportation services teams have been using these legacy tools for decades, we learned a lot by co-designing with them. What you're seeing right now is an image of an affinity mapping exercise that we did. We kept an open line of communication with our stakeholders and this, you know, and like lead to on, ongoing engagement with our users to understand, you know, what, again, what do they need? What are their pain points? What are some of their behaviors? And are we on track to deliver it? This helps to build trust. And trust gives you the leverage you need to use the opportunities around you. So what really helped us was our government partners were already starting to incorporate agile practices into their work, like daily standups and sprint plannings, and this helped make work visible, helped build consensus and a shared vision all together. And, and, and along with that, we saw that there were a lot of new opportunities from the technical side, maybe at the cloud services group, the open data group, groups that didn't exist five or 10 years ago. And reaching out to those groups, building relationships with them meant that we could accelerate our development while building trust in our process uh, from both a user and a technical side across the organization. Exactly. And of course, by building these relationships with stakeholders and understanding their needs, users were not just willing, but they're excited to give us their time and feedback. But we didn't do this just once, but over and over again. And this continuous process also aligns with the practice of iterative development, which means that we keep building towards a solution and deliver value quickly. So what does that look like? Well, we start with a prototype, something bare bones. Uh, it's, it's quick uh, to give you a sense of the earliest version of an idea. This is an example of an early version of the mapping interface. From here, we then test with our users. Then we take their feedback and improve the prototype. So continuing this example, we learned that users enjoyed uh, familiar mapping interfaces such as Google Maps. What do you think we did after building that? That's right. We tested them with our users. As we do this, we get closer to a fully realized product. But unlike tra like traditional models of development, uh, we get value in front of users quickly. So we're not, again, like Kevin mentioned previously, like we're not going to some closed off space and then delivering the product to you once it's done. Instead, as you saw throughout this talk right here, our users know exactly what to expect because they're consistently part of that product development process. And so why do we do this? I'm gonna read this quote from the director of traffic management here. 
it makes good business sense to prioritize and deliver features that unlock the most value. As an organization focused on service delivery, it's imperative that we embrace iterative development. Uh, we couldn't have said this better than this ourselves. And now what we'd love to do is uh, share a very, very quick demo of Move. Um, for me, the sound is not coming through. I'm not sure if that's true for anyone else. Well, it seems like the audio is not coming out. But what you're seeing in front of you right now is the map interface and uh, I'm noticing that there are some questions coming in already. That's great to see and love to get to them afterwards. So that's a sort of exa uh, quick example of where we're at now. Sorry that the audio didn't work, um, but you can kind of get the gist of uh, an application that provides sort of a map-based interface to access this data. Uh, that's where we're at now. Uh, we've built a lot of processes around like specific reports that people need and specific uh, analysis of the collision and volume data. But then the question is, OK, we ship this thing. Where do we go from here? There are a lot of directions we could do. But we always come back to the, that sort of central question of what is the greatest need? What do people need? What do people want? What, uh, what aligns with their vision? Uh, and we've already done things like uh, immediately after launch, going into a visioning workshop with a lot of our stakeholders to understand, OK, set aside where the division is at now, what this looks like right now. If you had to look at your work two, three, five, ten, 10, whatever years from now, what would you like that to look like? And uh, one of the things that we've heard loud and clear whenever we ask that question is uh, similar to what a lot of organizations want, which is how can we unlock more data-driven capacity? You know, how can we be using data in better ways for more of our, our processes? And it's, it's a difficult question. It's a long journey. It's not, there is no magic bullets, no single product that will deliver that for people. It's process it involves a lot of culture change, a lot of training a lot of awareness of even what data is available and what you can do with it. And there's sort of a challenge and an opportunity at transportation services in that, in that we, work, we work alongside people in the data analytics team who are maybe much further along this journey than many other parts of the organization. And so the challenge is, can we use this to, can we use this product, this project to take some of that knowledge and disperse it more widely to give everyone in the division the benefit of this. Uh, to that end, I'm really excited actually to announce that uh, we've reached another important milestone with the project today, which is that this morning we re re released a, um, an open data set to the city's open data portal that covers the last 40 years of what's called turning movement counts. So wherever people are moving through intersections, whether that's cars, buses, bikes, pedestrians, um, that data is now available for use by the public. And that's something we're super excited to do more of as we go along to help build some of this capacity, not just internally, but also externally as well. Uh, last but certainly not least, I wanted to give a huge, huge, huge shout out to uh, Maddie, Akash, and Jesse, uh, who I believe are all here with us today. Uh, and you can definitely ask them questions as well. But uh, this, is, this is a team effort uh, that is, it's not just shine myself. It's not even just shine myself and these three people. It's We've had the fellowship team, we've had people at Code for Canada who have helped us, it helped even make this project possible. Um, we've had a lot of support from a lot of different people in the civic tech community. And uh, so I really want to underscore, this is, this is as it always is, a team effort. Uh, so thank you to everyone who has, who has helped make this a reality. Uh, and with that, we'll switch into the breakout rooms.
I'm going to share my screen so that uh, to walk you through how we are doing the breakout rooms. Um, so these are the three options that we have. Code for Canada staff. Uh, Luke talked about all the programs that we have. So we have some program staff in the team. If you have any questions about what we do, join us there. Um, the second breakout room is digital government with Jesse Nakash. I'll let Jesse Nakash give a little intro and what they want, might want to talk about. Uh, yeah, so our, our breakout room is really going to cover anything, um, any questions that anyone has about the process we went through to, to get the team on board, um, any questions about, you know, building building digital projects in government, and if people have questions about traffic volume data, we're happy to answer those types of questions as well. So anything really that you can think of. Cool. And then our third room is going to be more about Move. If you have any questions about the tool, the process getting there, um, how it feels like to work in an embedded government team, chat with Shine, Evan, and Maddie there. Okay, so just a few quick tips. Uh, if you're on mobile, if you tap the screen once the breakout rooms open, you should have this little pop-up um, in the top corner, and then you can choose the one and join it. Um, on desktop, you have the breakout room button at the bottom, and you can choose a breakout room. We've realized that if you're joining from a web browser, you might not have access to uh, choose your own breakout room. So please just put into the chat which room you're interested in joining, and we will place you. Um, at this time, I'm also going to stop the recording. So feel free to turn your cameras back on.